Hello, Honors Chemistry, and welcome to Chapter 9, Sections 9.4, 9.5, and 9.6, where we talk about the Bohr model of the atom. So we said previously the whole point of this unit, right, the whole point of discussing light in this unit, right, is because the interactions between light and electrons give us information about the inside of an atom looks like, right? And here is where we finally tease that out with the Bohr model, right? So here we have a hydrogen lamp, which means that this is full of hydrogen gas, right? And here, right, this is plugged into, say, the wall, right? And what it does is it runs an electric current through there. That should look kind of familiar because that's the exact same technology behind neon lights, right? So we've got that gas trapped in there. We run an electric current through it. And as we run an electric current through it, it emits a certain glow. And a lot of different gases have their own particular glow, okay? And we, again, we take it and we focus it through a slit and then a prism. And then it turns out that when we do that with hydrogen light, we only see three bands of color, okay? Three bands of color as opposed to that continuous spectrum that we saw when we took white light, right? So now we're only seeing three bands and that's it, right? Um, and it turns out helium has its own spectrum, neon has its own spectrum, and a lot of things have their own fingerprint spectrum uh, when subjected to a light emission test, right? Um, and so now let's see what that light is doing on the inside of the atom, right? So first of all, we have an electron here, right, which is sitting in its ground state, right? That's an electron in the ground state or the n equals 1 state for this particular electron, right? Ground is whatever is the standard state for that electron. In this case, we're going to look at one that's starting here, right? It's going to absorb some energy in the form of a photon. It doesn't have to be a photon, right? It can be in the form of electricity or some other heat energy, right? But basically, it has to be of the right wavelength, and it'll take that electron and excite it to a different energy level, right? And now, it's gone from n equals 1 to n equals 3, right? And what will happen to all the electrons that get excited, right, it will relax back down, okay? All electrons that get excited will relax back down, right? Not necessarily to the ground state, but it will relax, right? So in this case, it goes from n equals 2 down to, I um, mean, n equals 3 down to n equals 1. And as it does, it has to give off energy, right? In order to step down in energy, it must release an amount of energy, in this case, light emission, right, in the form of a photon, right? And so then what that photon tells us, right, is that if we can check out the wavelength, the frequency, O, energy, right, all those things go together, right? If we can monitor that photon, then that photon will tell us about the energy transition that the electron just underwent, yes? That photon relays information about the energy change that that electron just underwent, okay? And that gives us one of the colors of our spectrum, yes, the light emission spectrum, okay? Um, okay, and so this is what's happening inside the atom, right? Electrons absorb energy, when they relax, they give off energy, right? Point is, all of this corresponds to the Bohr model, right? In that electrons have energy levels that are permitted, right? Quantized energy levels, right? And your book likens it to rungs of a ladder, right? Um, in that you cannot be in between those spaces, right? But any on any of those rungs, right? And you can go up or down. Um, energy is required to go up. Energy is released when you go down, okay? But then it turns out that that model is only good for pretty much the hydrogen atom or any one electron species, which means there must be something else that's happening, right? Something else going on inside the atom, which brings us to the currently accepted model of the atom. And again, all of these are models, right? These are, these are scientists that take the data that they get and do their best to piece that data together in a way that makes sense about stuff that is microscopic, right? Um, so anyway, quantum mechanical model. We're in not just shells, but now we also have subshells, <laughs> subshells and orbitals, right? Where an orbital, so no longer orbits, but orbitals are where electrons um, can exist within an atom, right? These are the places where electrons can exist in an atom. And so these are two different representations, right? Where this dot diagram sort of just gives us all the hypothetical places an electron could be, right, inside the atom. And uh, it turns out that certain orbitals have certain shapes. S orbitals have a spherical shape that sort of centers around the center, if we're thinking about x, y, and z axes, where this would be like the nucleus of our atom, right? Um, we have other types of shapes right here where we are lobes on each of the x, y, and z axes, and these would be called p orbitals. 
And then like your book says, there are D orbitals, F orbitals, and after that they're alphabetical, right? So there are hypothetical uh, G, H, I, et cetera, et cetera, orbitals, right? Should we end up with elements that large, okay? Um, now, so again, what that means, right, is that we have shells, and each shell is composed of a certain number of subshells. You will note that whatever shell we're on, which still is the relative distance from the nucleus, right, whatever shell we are on dictates the total number of subshells, which then sort of dictates how many electrons can fit there, right? And if we also think that our n determines our proximity to the nucleus, right, the further we are from the nucleus, like the more literal space there is in three dimensions for electrons to exist, right? So it makes sense that there would be more opportunities for electrons to exist in those further shells, okay? Um, and again, here are the labels for those subshells, okay? Here is uh, one of the diagrams from your book, right, about all the different levels, right? So here we have the first shell, right? So this number corresponds to our shell, and this is our subshell, right? And these lines represent our actual orbitals, okay? So what that means is this first part represents the shell, n equals 1, subshell is s, and that line represents the orbital, and each orbital can hold up to two electrons. Yes, shell, subshell, orbital can hold up to two electrons, right? And again, when we get up to number 2, right, now we have two subshells, the s and the p, and it turns out that the P subshells are always a group of three, right? Um, the D subshells, when we get up there, are always a group of five. The F subshells, when we get there, are always a group of seven. And I think you see the pattern, should we have to proceed further than that, right? Um, so then what we can do is we can use this diagram to go ahead and write some electron configurations. Where what is an electron configuration? Right, just the arrangement of electrons within an atom, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to do the orbital diagram and the electron configuration for some elements, right? So hydrogen, before we can do that, we just have to know there how many electrons there are, right? So hydrogen has one electron, right? So we just, we will always start from the lowest energy orbital and work our way up. So we will start here. And that single-headed arrow represents an electron. We've done the electron configuration of hydrogen, and we would say 1s1 where this is the shell, subshell, and the number of electrons in that subshell, okay? Electron configurations are sort of a shorthand versus the orbital diagram, okay? Next up, let's say we were going to do helium. Helium has how many electrons? Right, two electrons. Oh, ta-da! And we would call this 1s2, right? Shell, subshell, number of electrons. Now let's say we were going to get one bigger even, and we were going to do lithium, right? This has three electrons, so that means we'll do one, two. Oh, an orbital can only hold two, so where must this next electron go? Right, the next energy, next lowest energy orbital, right? So now it would say 1s2, 2s1, yes? Now... Let's say we wanted to do beryllium, which has how many electrons? Right, four electrons. So what's the only thing that changes? Right, I'm going to just add one more electron here, and this now becomes 2s2, right? Let's say I wanted to do boron, which has five electrons. Now what? Right, I just have to add one more, and that would go here. And this becomes 2p1, right? Now let's say I wanted to do carbon, which has six electrons. Now, right, it's going to go here, and that's called Hund's rule, okay? Hund's rule says that anytime we have a set of degenerate orbitals, meaning equal in energy, see how these are all on the same horizontal uh, spread, right? Anytime we have a set of orbitals, is basically what it says, right? We'll always distribute them one per orbital, and then we'll go back and pair them, right? So for carbon, we don't need to do that, right? So it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 2, right? Going back to the fact that the orbital node, the electron configuration is meant to be a shorthand, right? Now let's try another one. Let's say we wanted to do nitrogen, right? I think we could imagine what happens here. So this is 70 electrons, right? We'll put one more there. 
and this becomes 2p3, right? Now, let's say we get to something a smidge bigger, and we want to do oxygen, which has eight electrons. Now, we will pair that first electron, right? Because P is not full, we just spread them out first before we pair them, which means that now this becomes 2P4, right? And that's one of the ways to double check ourselves. Our orbital diagram has two, four, six, eight total electrons, and my electron configuration has eight total electrons, right? We have done an okay job so far. Now let's say we wanted to do, let's skip ahead a little bit, and let's say we wanted to do neon, right? Which has 10 electrons, right? Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, I counted right. That's ten electrons, right? Um, and so then this would be 2p6. That also represents ten electrons. And you'll see that here, right? When we talk about um, helium, neon, argon, etc., etc., all of those are called the noble gases. And thinking back to middle school, what that meant is that they were especially stable. They did not interact with other elements quite readily, right? And that has to that goes back to the fact that they have a full valence, right? And when we say full valence, what that means is that their S and P subshells are full, right? When we say that something has a full valence, it means that their S and P subshells are full, just like in this particular instance, yes? And we could keep going and no worries, we will practice, 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 and you will you will be very, very good at this soon, I promise. And even if it's still a little bit fuzzy right now, that's fine because with practice, I assure you, the patterns will emerge and you will you will get it, okay? Um, I put an extra one there just in case I didn't want to keep erasing. Now, you might think to yourself, how am I supposed to memorize which all these are? Am I just supposed to memorize the whole thing? I don't know. And the answer is there's a little diagram in your book that helps you memorize, right? Where what we would do is we write out all the shells, all the potential shells and subshells, right? So 1s, 2s and then 2p, then 3s and then 3p, and then 3d, right? 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, right? Um, and then we have 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, and it could keep going to 5g, right? Hypothetically, we just don't have a need for those yet because none of our atoms are quite that big, right? Um, 6s, 6p, 6d, 6f, right? 7s, 7p, uh, 7d, and 7f, right? And then what we do is we just sort of imagine, right, drawing a diagonal line through each of these, right? So we start here, draw a diagonal line, and then we take it back over here, and we draw another diagonal line, take it back over here, draw another diagonal, take it back, draw another diagonal, Take it back, take it back. And then what it does is it basically tells you the order of filling for all the orbitals, yes? Um, and then it's just up to you to remember, right, that this one is a set of always one, right? S's always come in a set of one. P's are always a set of three, right? D's are always a set of five orbitals. That's a five, right? And F's are always a set of seven, right? In terms of how many sets they are. This should say always one. All right, um, we're going to pause here. You're going to do a whole bunch of practice in class, and I assure you it's going to sink in, even if it feels kind of fuzzy right now. All right, thank you for listening. Be good, and I will see you soon. Bye.